Habakkuk, yeah, chapter 3. I, I'm going to go here in just a moment, not right at the moment. We'll leave it up on the wall for you. And uh, if, the easiest way to find him is you just, you, you kind of just got to go to, you know, uh, Zechariah is one of the biggest minor prophets there at almost the end, next to last, and go left a few and you'll find him. Uh, tucked away in there. I'll get to that in just a moment, minute. I want to speak this morning on, I'm going to deal with prayer. I'm going to deal with uh, different aspects. I simply entitled the message, Moving Heaven Towards You. Moving Heaven Towards You. And I want to tell you something. You can move heaven towards you. Whether you know it or not, you will by the end of this message. You can move heaven towards you while you're living on this earth. But isn't it interesting that many times the people who know you the least always have the most to say? <laughs> I know what you just thought there, just like with Habakkuk. You're thinking to yourself, would you please repeat it? I'm going to. Many times the people who know you the least always have the most to say, and that's true. Here's another one for you. Rumors can make you hate innocent people and love hypocrites. Amen. Be careful of listening to too many rumors and believing them. Uh, how many knows whisper down the lane? How many's ever played that game? You start out in one end and you get down. They used to call it whisper down the lane. How many knows? And I never, I remember in elementary school playing that game. The teacher would do it. And, and I don't remember one time after it got through about 30 students, I don't remember one time that it was ever at the end said what was originally said at the beginning. Not one. Matter of fact, it was so bad, it wasn't even the same topic. Do you remember that? He was, it says, wasn't he? Now the, I don't know where it all got goofed up. People added to, took away, and it started out like, you know, something as simple as, you know, we are going to the zoo. By the time it got to the 30th person, it was, we are having mashed potatoes for lunch today. It was just nothing even associated. So let that be a lesson. Rumors, rumors have a very powerful pl a part to play. If you believe it, it can make you hate innocent people and love hypocrites. Normally people who start rumors, they are the ones who know the least. Now, I'm going to get into prayer in just a moment, but I want you to see this too, how the enemy operates compared to God and how he operates. When you're walking down through life, we all, now, now, some of you in here may think you've never made a mistake or anything like that, but all of us down through life up until the present moment we are right now have probably have a grocery cart of mistakes, missteps, things we wished or regretted that was ever done in our lives, and we are the ones not done to us, we did it ourselves. Amen. Yes, that is true. Thank you. Yes, that, boy, I got a lot of, <laughs> Laurie, did you say amen? Okay. And so when you're going down, the, but here's what the enemy likes to do. What God wants to do is when we ask forgiveness, all that, what, what he does is he forgets it. All of that is forgotten. He has amnesia, self-imposed, never brings it up to you again, never reminds you about it, nothing. He never talks about it. So anytime a voice brings back your past to remind you it is never God's voice. Why? He never exists in your past. Here's the one that does it, and here's what he does. The, the devil, Satan, the adversary, and everybody that helps him in that dark world is all along your life's way is taking snapshots and pictures, photographs of every time you goof. Amen. Has a Rolodex of photographs of your life of every mistake. Isn't it interesting? The devil never reminds you of what you did right. Have you ever had, I've never had the devil come to my, my mind and say, Reuben, my, remember five years ago, wow, that was awesome. What he will do is he'll bring an image. Do you ever take notice of this? Ever take notice of this? It's not just reminding you of, say, verbiage in your mind. There's always a picture of it. 
You can see what happened. Why is that? <laughs> it's because the adversary has taken a photograph and he, at that moment, when you're getting emotionally, maybe whatever the case, and all of a sudden this, rem this remembrance comes and, and all of a sudden Satan, he'll come, he'll bring a photograph, shove it right in the front of your mind's eye and won't just talk about it. He'll make sure you see what you did. And then what he's going to try to do is, is work guilt and condemnation and then ultimately wants to bring you to a place of just feeling unworthy of any kind of success in your present and any kind of hope in your future because he wants to remind, well, you know, all of these failures there has disqualified you from any expectation of something even greater in your future. Because all of that, all of that together in this bushel basket is really who you are. I want to remind you this morning, you can remind me of things I've done in my past, and it's true I did it, but I don't any longer. You can remind me of saying, that is what you were, yes, but I'm not that person any longer. Why? The world calls it evolution. God calls it sanctification. Here's a better word. It's called growth. Somebody just says, did you say it? mature? It's, 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 and that's the ultimate end of it is maturity. Just breathe if you have to. What does God do? What does God do? Look at the biblical narrative. I'm going to make this up. Look at the biblical narrative. Look at Joseph, look at anybody you want to look at. Look at Moses, look at anybody. What did God do? Did God take photographs of all the past failures and say, here's your future? In the middle of their position, place, wherever it was, God would show them photographs, but not of their past, not of their mistakes, not of their fouls or failures or downfalls. What would he show them? He would show them always the future. He would bring to them, this is where I want you to go, and here's what it looks like. Oh, my. I love that. Joseph had a dream of what it was going to look like. I know you found fault with God after that. Why didn't he show him pictures of the pit? Why didn't he show him pictures of the prison? Why didn't he show him pictures? Why didn't God spare Joseph from being in the house that day with Potiphar's wife. There's a lot of whys here. Why? Did God know that was going to happen? Did he know it was in Potiphar's wife's heart? Yes. Oh, wow. I know what you're thinking. They don't teach this down the other day. I think I'm going down there next week. Now, this is, this is the truth of it. This is, again, this is, all of these messages kind of just blend together. What have we been learning? I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that, that we have to be careful of having the, a misunderstanding. God will use you to get his glory. God will put, will allow you to get into situations that's going to create you a whole lot of discomfort. Amen. Amen. And it's not that he's sadistic and gets high on your pain. God is using you because the greater, the greater that darkness is, the greater the light is going to happen. Why did Joseph in that, what was God doing at that moment? He was showing the world and many generations later to this day even and beyond if the Lord tarries. He's showing what? He's showing that a man can have the character of Christ even when no one is looking. Amen. How is that going to happen? How is he going to have that example unless somebody faces it? Why am I going through what I'm going? Because God wants an example for others to see. Job, why am I going? Because God wanted an example to the devil himself to show that people will serve me not because I gave them a lottery winning. Whew. 
man, I'm really going. Now, now when we're going through the struggles of life, we realize at times, where is God? You know, you hear that sinner say that. Well, where is God? There was a mass shooting. There was this and that and the other thing. God didn't perpetrate that. God doesn't. Every, every, and here's another thing I wish, I wish preachers would quit saying. God is in control of everything. Is that right? Well, uh, if he is, then so God stirred up somebody to go kill 20 people. Come on. That's ridiculous. He's not the author of that. Who is? There's an adversary called Satan. Well, hallelujah. We have to get right, accurate thinking, don't we? Let me tell you something. If God is in control of everything, he, listen, then, then why are we aborting babies the way we do? What is it now, 60 million? God did all of that? Come on. That's not biblical. There's no precedent of that anywhere to put that in anyone's mind. God is in control of where obedience is active. Disobedience nullifies any of his protective services or anything else. This is why I say, even on the road and so forth, I mean, you can, you can break the speed limit and not go to hell. But, but willingly disobeying the law, God's hand, why, oh, it's disobedience. Huh? And you get a fine and say, God, why did you do that to me? He didn't. I did. That's the cop is back in his car writing you out that $300, $400 fine. Yeah, he's writing that fine out. God, what, what are you trying to teach me? Slow down. <laughs> God, how can you do that to me? You know I'm penny pinching. Well, <laughs> when we get saved, we do not get stupid. We are to get more in intelligent. Am I right? Now, <clears throat> I'm coming up here. Just wait. When we are praying, I'm going to come to the significance of all of this when we get to Habakkuk, and then that's going to be the last portion of this message. Do you know that God already knows everything about you? We want to be effective in our prayers, but God, first of all, let's start with this precedent. God knows everything about you. There's not one thing about you he does not know. So when you pray, be direct, be honest. And the reason is he rewards integrity. He knows when I'm concealing something. So what we are to do is when we're in prayer, always talk it out with the Lord. You can trust the one who made you. He has all the time in the world to hear from you. In other words, do not edit your conversations with God. With flowery language and trying to conceive, God sees us. If I'm praying and I'm editing my conversations because I'm concealing something, then what it is, God will not reward that because I'm not, be, I'm not having integrity. I'm trying to deceive him. Be totally open with him. You can even tell he is the one person being you can tell your secrets to and doesn't get blabbed to anyone else. Did somebody just say hallelujah? It's true, isn't it? It's you can tell God anything and nothing gets shared. Matter of fact, when, when you tell God something, he does not call a meeting of 357 angels and say, you ain't going to believe what I just heard. <laughs> when you get in joy, learn this, when you get into God's, any time that, any time you spend time with him, practically speaking. What does that mean? Anytime you spend time with God is when your focus is exclusively on him, it's prayer time. Okay? Doesn't mean he's not there any other time, but at this moment, you're, you're there, enjoy his presence. When you get into the presence of God, something happens that does not happen anywhere else. Okay? 
bring to him, learn to bring to God your fears, your worries, your doubts, even your tears. Why? Why do that? Because you greatly matter to him. You don't have to impress God. Why? He realizes probably how unimpressive we can be. When you come to God, don't come thinking you're going, I'm, I'm, I tell you, wait, I'm going to, I'm going to say some things. It's going to just, it's going to make his mind go numb. He is the most intelligent being ever. I'm not going to say anything that just mesmerizes him. I would imagine it takes a lot of grace being that intelligent to put up with hearing how stupid we can be. Think about that. Can you imagine? He's all intelligent, and I come to him thinking I'm intelligent. He's like, Whew, man, I was kind of dumb. <laughs> Bring to him your fears, worries, doubts, and tears. Why? You, you really matter to him. Why do you know? How do you know that? Remind yourself right there. You really matter to God. So enjoy being in his presence. Why? I, I, I'm going to give you another news bulletin because he actually enjoys you. I can tell by the lackluster response, you don't believe that. <laughs> Pam, Pam does, but I mean, just, I, but many, we don't believe that. Well, he doesn't really like, he died for you. He enjoys your company. I can be as dumb as a stump, but he enjoys me. I can see I need to spend time on this. You have to realize your worth, not in your own value that you brought up, but you have to understand your own worth to him is, is premised on what he did for us. Christ made you valuable to the point he enjoys you. As a matter of fact, every sinner in this world, he has a deep, deep, sincere love for. Now, we'd like to just take half of them and just get rid of them. But in, but in reality, God says, no, 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 I gave them space to repent. I love them. So I love them. Actually, I love them as much as I love you. Hmm. See, in Psalm, I don't have these on the wall, I don't want them up, but I just give you references in Psalm 1611, thou shalt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. At the right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. That's for us. Always expect an answer. When you come into prayer, always expect an answer. Faith is what? When you enter into, you have to come with boldness. The only way you come with boldness is in faith. How do you even have faith is you have to have a clear conscience. If there's any guilt that is ruining your perception of what, if something has been done and you're carrying a guilt, that'll, that will take away your faith, which takes away your confidence to even approach God. Faith is confidence in God. Faith comes when God talks. Faith cometh by uh -huh. it, it may be through a ministry, the Holy Spirit, His Word. There's multiple ways, but His, His talk is what produces faith. Expectation, what does His Word do to us? creates expectation. Why does it create, why does it create expectation? Let me tell you something. A lot of people in the world can read the Bible and have no expectation. A lot of people in the world can hear a preached word in the anointing and everything and not have any expectation. Why does that word bring expectation to us? Because we believe his track record, he's never lied. So whatever he says, if he's for all of these years of recorded history now for 6,000 years approximately, all of this record, he's never lied. Now, how many knows if somebody hasn't lied in 10 years, he, they have good integrity. Well, what happens if they've never lied in 6,000 years? I would say probably if he says something to you today, tomorrow it will be fulfilled. Expectation is something invisible in your life. It creates something. Expectation creates an invisible current in our life that sweeps miracles literally into your life. 
It's an invisible current. Expectation creates an invisible current. You can't see it, but it's an invisible current that literally sweeps miracles into your life for you to experience. All of them are divine appropriated. Okay? Here's, here's another thing. Now, I'm telling you, I'm really learning some things, okay? I got them in notes here, notes here, everywhere. But it, just learning things. I can be an emotional person. I know half of you shocked. I'm, a, I'm like, uh, okay, I'm throwing myself under the bus here, and you can learn from my experience if it's up to you, and you don't have to say a word, and, and you can act, you know, like, oh, I don't know what he's talking about. But I am, I'm very animated. You sit in a meeting with me, you'll know exactly what I'm thinking. I don't try to, it's just, it's who we are, it's who I am, okay? It's just, if I don't like something, it'll show. <laughs> if I like it, if I think it's stupid, it'll show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but with that, that doesn't mean it's all right. I'm just saying that it's, 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 the struggle is real. But my emotions, they can flame up and go down just like that, okay? But I've learned something. I'm an emotional person. I'll lose my man card even. <laughs> I do. I, it's, I see. I'm really, see, I'm being, so you all say, well, I don't know where you're, okay, all right. I'll throw myself out. I do. I lose my man card. I cannot watch. They call it a chick flick. Romance. A romantic movie. I'll be the first to say I'll, I'll tear up, Connie. It gets bad. I've been on more than one airplane, and I, I'll never forget, what's his name, Everett, I'll never, Dr. Everett. <laughs> man, I was watching that, I don't know what it was. It was, oh, it got to me, I had, man, I put my finger up like I couldn't, it seeped out and went down. I, I'm leaning against my seat here watching this movie, and all of a sudden I feel somebody staring at me across the aisle. There's the doctor. <laughs> I thought, oh, man, he's seen it, he sure did. I looked over at him, I'm filled up, and he said, Dog, he said, you just lost your man card. <laughs> <laughs> and the emotional person I am, I said, shut up and mind your own business. <sighs> I, <laughs> was that crazy rich Asians I watched? I was, on, I was on one one time, cried so bad. I had a, I had a steward bring me, uh, what do you call them? Not napkins. Well, like napkins. He said, are you okay? Did you go through a tragedy or something? I said, no, I'm, this movie, I can't take it. I'm done with it. <laughs> I tried to fly in Clint Eastwood after that. I said, I need something here. <laughs> I wanted to tell him, oh, it's my wife. You know, she just drove me crazy, but it wasn't true. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Shut up, Shannon. I don't want to hear it. I, don't, I did cry in Maverick. I, I did. All right. When you get into his prayer, but here's the thing. You know, but I found some solace. I found that God is emotional. It, it is true, Connie, isn't it? It is. He's emotional. He experiences joy. He experiences sadness. He grieves. He, uh, he, he gets upset. He has anger. So when you get in his presence, you can speak to him freely. He is actually thrilled that you've decided to turn to him concerning it instead of anybody else. That's called friendship. That's called coming. It doesn't mean you're d disrespectful or lower him down out of holiness or any of those things. He is the king. 
But there is a side to him with us in relationship is a deep, deep friendship. He would rather us turn to him. Listen, Peter said some pretty nasty things to Jesus already, that, but Peter was not trying to be, he wasn't trying to ruin holiness or any of those things. But Peter himself was, was a person who was highly emotional. Maybe that's why we identify with him. He was highly emotional. He, he spoke out before he thought at times. And notice Jesus. Jesus would correct him return, but never threw him away. He would rather Peter talk to him about it than go to their other fellows. Amen? <clears throat> picture your miracle. It, it, God begins everything with a picture. He, he, I, I kind of referred to this earlier, but God pointed out the stars to Abraham to stir his faith for children. The woman diseased for 12 years, what, saw a picture in her heart. It moved her to touch the robe of Jesus, the hem of his garment. Always guard that picture of God that he's placed within you. It's the key to your miracle. In Matthew 9, 21, for she said within herself, you know the story, if I may but touch his garment, I shall behold. She had a picture of that. Believe me, that erupted from the knowledge of what Christ was doing on the earth at that time. You learn to pray your expectations. I got something to say in this. Words matter. Words really do matter. They'll create life or death. Amen. Your mind and your faith respond to anything you say. Amen. Never verbalize anything you do not really want to happen. Pray your expectations, not your experiences. Pray expectations. Do not pray the long list of things that you've experienced that was taking you down the tube. Pray expectations. In Mark eleven twenty three, you know it well, but for verily I say to you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he shall say, or shall or that which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Whatever he says. Your mind will come into accordance to what you're saying. Your mind will expect what you verbalize. Your faith responds on that. Amen? Do not sabotage, do not sabotage yesterday's prayers. Let us suppose you have just asked God, even for the salvation of a spouse or a loved one or children or friends or whomever. Guess what? If I've prayed that, according to the Bible, he has heard me. Right? So if he's heard me, it mattered. He has promised a response to my prayer to your prayers. That's Bible. That means when I prayed yesterday, when you prayed yesterday, events now are already in motion. Right? 24 hours later. Do not come back today and speak words of doubt and unbelief to God or others because you may paralyze everything God set into motion. Believe that. If I prayed it yesterday, follow it up today with words affirming what I prayed yesterday. Meaning, speak your expectations. How many times do we sabotage what we prayed yesterday? Now we fill today with unbelief that nullifies everything we prayed yesterday. Hmm. Always establish a, a place of prayer. Places do matter to God. He made them. Two and you know, think of these places. All of these places had significance, and they were places of prayer. The upper room. Jericho. Bethel. Zarephath. Gethsemane. All through your Bible, there are places significant with prayer. Why? It's where people made prayer. The geographical location, this is where I will meet God. Jesus had special places of prayer. He had, he had mountains that he would go to. He had Gethsemane. Sanctified your own personal prayer. It would become precious, treasured place. In Matthew 14, 23, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. 
I'm going get, to get up here because time's going to slip away from us. Always remember when God reminds you of something that has not been dealt with, repent quickly because it'll be something that is stopping the answer to prayer. He doesn't want you to waste your time praying about something and you've not taken care of it. Repent. Let me just say this. Your mistakes, sins, failures have not shocked God. He actually anticipated your need for mercy long before anything happened. <laughs> God is not waiting there with a ball bat and he's just going to make you suffer. The greatest thing that can happen is God and acknowledge it when he sh shows you and says, look, this has not been taken care of. There needs to be, your heart has to change. If it doesn't change, you're going to keep creating and recreating the same problem in your life into the future. This is what I would tell, you know, women and men. You know, let's, on the women's side, you know, we call them now, they're just souped up terms, it gets a little weird, but, you know, it, we'll say these things, you know, toxic relationships. And there is such a thing as just, what does that mean? Just people using and abusing them. But you ever take notice, a lot of them go from one to the other that have the same problem. And here's the issue. Before you leave one, rela or leave one relationship, you need to, that individual needs to get healed of whatever is, is attracting them to the same kind of issue. Why are they still going after the same kind of, I mean, didn't you learn your lesson here? The, the problem is there's something in them that's craving something in there that keeps walking them into the same problem. That person, whether it's a woman or man, needs healed of that. So before I get answers to prayer, if there's something inhibited, God will tell me, look, this needs to be taken care of. This needs to be repented of. You've got to see it, recognize it, repent of it, and then we can have this channel just continually be flowing freely between us. And the master key to that is repentance, okay? Don't, and here's the worst thing to do. We do it before others. Never do it before God. It doesn't work. He sees it. Never justify yourself to God for whatever happened. Well, God, I had a right. Well, he knows you didn't. Well, God, you don't know what they, he does know what they did. Well, I tell you, it's just awful what they, well, he, he understands that. That's not the point. It's awful what they did to Jesus on the cross. And that's something if Jesus would have did the same thing, I'll tell you what, Father, this is ridiculous. You don't know what these people have done to me. I've had it. I'm off here. I'm out. Thank the Lord he didn't do that. Do not justify and quit blaming others for the decisions you have made. Repent immediately. And then John 14, 14 comes into play. The moment I repent of it, immediately let it go, walk away from it, get absolved, and I don't blame anybody else. This is what happens. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. I have to trust God in forgiveness, and I've got to trust God <laughs> that he's able to give me the power to let people go. I have to trust God to the point that I don't need to exact vengeance on the person. <laughs> the greatest miracle is this, someone who has done me wrong, and the greatest miracle is when I can look at them with love and actually pray, God, forgive them and bless them. What a wonderful life of joy that is. Isn't it wonderful you don't have to carry all that baggage around of what everybody did to us? Who cares? <laughs> Maybe we ought to tell our neighbor that. Who cares? Connie and Dawn don't have neighbors. I don't. <laughs> now let's look at this. I'm going to show you how significant all of you in here, and according to this prayer and how short it can be. Ready? Here we go. Let's read it out loud. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon, 
Who knows how to really say that? In verse 2, O oh Lord, look at this. This is a prayer. One verse, one prayer. O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech, and I was afraid. Being honest, I heard your voice. And if you'd have heard him in the prior chapter and before, you'd realize, but we're just taking this out. It's fine. And he hears all this, and so he begins to pray. Oh, Lord, I've heard thy speech, and I was afraid. He is being honest with God. I'm fearful here. But, oh, Lord, notice what he says. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. We need revival. That's what he says. Habakkuk. We need revival, Lord, in the midst of the years. Think about that. Did you move on up there? Okay. Make known in wrath. In wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. God, in the middle of judgment, we're going to ask you to do something here. Remember your mercy. That's the end. Verse 2, and I'll read it all to you again. And, and just, that's it. That's the prayer. Habakkuk is there, and he's, he's, he's my, I'm going to intercede. I'm going to pray. And you would think he would, he would spent three days praying. But all he does, you can count it. I didn't count the words in verse 2. He just simply says, oh, Lord, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. Oh, Lord, revive thy work. Give us revival in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. And this little phrase, prayer, look at the response of God on that prayer. And God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. And you can read the rest of the chapter, it gets even just astounding. One man prayed, and look at this response. God himself comes from the Mount Sinai region, from the Edom region and comes and responds because this man simply prayed. When I thought about this, Habakkuk appears insignificant in the grand scheme of things when it comes to the Bible canon. You don't hear much about Habakkuk. It's only three chapters. Like I said before, most thinks it's, you know, some Star Wars brother. He writes out of all of the chapters of the Bible, he only writes and pens three of them, of the entire Bible. And he's also tucked away in the minor prophets, and he's rarely visited. He is never, that you'll ever really hear, you'll never hear his name mentioned in the same sentence as a Paul, a Peter, or a David, or Solomon, or anyone else. It is also interesting, Habakkuk had a, in his short chapters, he had a common thread. His public prayers were always short. <laughs> Until you indulge your, or delve into this and you begin to find out why, even though he didn't say a lot, but he had a power to impact heaven and bring heaven right into the earth's atmosphere. That this man could pray short public prayers and God would leave heaven and come to the earth. I, I honestly, I, I never saw this. I, I never, it never, hit, never dawned on me like this. I thought, isn't that amazing? This man, and then it starts giving perspective to Jesus saying to whosoever to us. How many knows whosoever is you? Any one of us in here. And he is, and, and, and whosoever shall call upon my name, and, and God will answer of you. All of those, I mean, tons of verses, Jesus, and then through the epistle, all of this, clar the clarification of what's happening. He said, it's, it's not how many words you say.
But I found that with Habakkuk, because he enters an emotional response in there, and he says, I have some fear here. And this is telling me that Habakkuk, when he was praying this, though short, was very passionate. Then it took me to James. I was thinking about this, that the prayers of that that righteous person, that, that person who, who prays with a fire, that prays with passion, that prays with conviction, that prays that actually is, is holding on. We say to the horns that, that comes out of the Old Testament, but literally holding on to the horns of the altar, regardless of where it is in your life, and you're holding on to that. And, and, and it's not just plaza, it's not just sarasra, it's not just, well, God, if it's your will. But when we pray like this, there, God, not your, it's not saying, God, if it's your will, God, there is no alternative. You must move in this situation. And his passion is borne out in these short words in verse two. And, and God, I, I've heard that. I've heard what you said. And God, I was, I trembled emotionally. It shook me to the core that God, because when you speak, I, I know your integrity. But then what he did was he shifted gears and he came, uh, all of this stuff that was decreed in judgment and all of this stuff that's going on, in the middle of that, he takes hold of the horns in the altar. He's, he's emotionally engaged now. He's passionate. He can't bear the thought of destruction. He can't bear the thought we're going to get destroyed. We, I can't bear the thought that God could turn his back on us. We deserve it. And all of a sudden, he grabs on. He's not letting go in that altar of sacrifice. And he's saying, Lord, I, I tell you, I, I'm afraid. And then he shifts gears, and he comes to God with this. I'm fear now, but I'm going to play on something else. I'm going to play on the position that you've given me, that I'm valuable in your sight. That you are, you are sending a Messiah. All of these lambs, all of this sacrifice is symbolizing the coming Messiah. That we are important. We are valuable to you. And I come to you not on my own merit, but I come on what this blood is representing. That Jesus Christ, the Messiah, that someone is coming to stand in our... I'm, gonna, I'm not standing here, God, defiantly. In, I'm, I'm here humbly, but with boldness. And I'm calling on you, Lord, revive, bring revival in the midst of it. sounds illogical. But God, as the streams of, uh, of secularism, as the streams of paganism, as the streams of deception is sweeping the planet in the wrong direction, God, we're going to stand up in the middle of this, uh, of this torrential waterfall and we're going to cry out. But God, as though we are fearful, we, we, we know what your word says. We know what the judgment is. We know, but God, in the middle of this, revive your work. Not because of who I am on my own, but because you have made me your own and you've made me significant in the middle of all of this. And he cries out, I know you have a right in your wrath to judge, but what I'm going to say is, God, remember your mercy. And God, if you can visualize this, God is sitting on his throne, listening to one man pray, who we never really talk about, who we might consider insignificant. The world didn't know his name. God did. And when this man was passionately short plea, God hears it and immediately gets up off his throne. And according to Ezekiel, he has a portable throne and they, he flies as an entourage. And he basically in an instant of time said, get, the, get, get everything ready, we're moving out. Where have we gone? That man prayed, he believed. What are you going to do, Father? We're going to earth. What are we going to do? We're going to do what he has asked. I'm not making this up. That's what happened. 
He came with such a display of power that it, the word, descri- the description of it is, it said, you, you can read in verse 4, and it said, his glory covered the heavens, and in an instant, the earth became filled with his praise. I'm telling you now, when God shows up, it's not quiet. It's not like most nominal churches. <laughs> Somebody shouts amen. <laughs> Heaven is loud. If you've got a nerve problem, you won't do well in heaven. <laughs> if you're jumpy here, get ready up there. People will shout. People will walk outside their mansions, mansions, probably unannounced. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Man, I'm glad I'm here. And there's not going to be policemen on the corner. You might offend somebody. I love it in heaven because there's nobody offended. <laughs> well, let's look at this just a little bit more. Like the woman with the issue of blood, we never know her name. When you get to heaven, you, you, you don't have to be told to you. Nobody, we don't know her name. Why? Insignificant to the world. She was just simply a woman that had a problem. That's how the world interpreted that. Poor, impoverished. She's nothing. And yet Jesus had a plan that day going to a house. An insignificant, impoverished, culturally now an outcast, interrupts the plan of Jesus and stops him and changes his calendar for the day. One little insignificant woman. However, an insignificant woman in the world on the heels of a small prayer, listen to this, but she uttered it with a fiery passion. How do you know it was passionate? Because people would have talked, tried to talk her out of it. How also do you know it was fiery within her because everything physically was trying to stop her? There were throngs of people that were trying to keep her away. She literally had to fight her way through. That's called passion. That's called faith. That's called boldness. Everybody in that crowd was keeping her. What are you doing? Get, stop. Get away. She fights her way through. But uttered with fiery passion and a move to the hem of his garment that even Satan himself could not stop. She moved heaven toward her that day. Satan could not stop that little insignificant woman. And do you think he tried? Well, you better believe he did. Every miracle, every miracle ruins the perception of what his ability is. Why was there throngs keeping her from it? Why? Why was people trying to talk her out of it? That's the enemy trying to keep her, keep her away, keep her away. Get inside her mind. Get inside her psyche. Get inside that mental. Get inside her. Ruin that faith. Ruin her confidence. Do whatever it takes. And he could not stop her. No, he can't. And it's, I come back to this word, whosoever. The Bible says whosoever, whosoever will. We sing, you sing the song, and it was one of dad's favorites, actually. Whosoever will. Whosoever. Do you know what that means? Whosoever. Whosoever means everyone counts and is significant in God's eyes. Do you know that every sinner 
who calls on the name of the Lord will get a response from God. I don't think you heard that. Every sinner, the Bible, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. After you're saved, you don't lose that significance. After you're saved, he, he, I just read a while ago on a, a John 4, ask what you will and he'll do it. Um, before I move on to the next one, trust me, whether it's Habak any of them, this, this does not work. Habakkuk as well. A any of them just saying, Lord, if it's your will, come and bring revival. Do you know where God is? He, all right, he's sitting here. Somebody down there. God, if it's your will, bring revival. But if it's not, Help us to get through. Do, do you know, you say, well, what does God do? He didn't even hear it. Now, I got good news for you men in here. I got, oh, I got good news for you men. God has selective hearing. It is a fact, Bible-based fact. God has selective hearing. God hears all prayers. No, he does not. The Bible even says it. He does not. It'd be something if we read the Bible and believed it. The Bible clearly states he does not hear all prayer. Well, I heard a preacher say it. Well, he, he didn't read the same Bible you do. He ate a cheeseburger, had a dream. It's simply not true. God doesn't, if I'm there, that's no faith. That's not faith. If I'm there saying, God, if it's your will, bring revival. But if it's not, help us through us. That's not faith. God is up there. He's eating, eating his lamb and chicken. I don't know. He's not even bothered with it. Nobody even reports it. The only thing that gets reported to him in that sense is, is from us, is faith. Well, God ain't up there eating. Well, you got to read the Bible. Yes, he does. It's all through the Bible. God eats. Are you all, do, do, do you read that? All right, we can start at the very beginning. You remember this in Genesis? God himself comes to the plains of memory. Did you remember this? God comes in with his entourage, leaves part of it behind. Him and two of his escorts show up at Abraham's tent and sits down and eats a non-vegetarian meal. <laughs> he ate. Let me fast, go all the way through. There's other places too. Go all the way through. Matter of fact, Jesus, after he was resurrected, was eating fish. Matter of fact, he had a, he, matter of fact, he likes a good barbecue. We did, had a fire on the beach. Hey, fellas, did you catch that? Come on in, I got fish on the fry here. At the very end, we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Notice it says supper. <laughs> We're all going to have supper. God's not going to sit there at the head of the table and think, I'm sorry, everybody. I don't eat, but I just did this for you. He's going to eat with us because he's been eating all through the Bible. I just thought I'd throw it in there. You got to read about and understand. Don't make God as a, he, he, he's God, but he does a lot of things. He created us in his image. It was going around years ago, you know, God's just some glob or something. No, he's got hands and feet, got a head, got a mouth, talks. As a matter of fact, he, he actually has the same features of a man. Ezekiel said as well, it looked like a man. Now, I don't think God looks like Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> I don't know how tall he is, doesn't say. I don't know how big he is. I don't think he's Pee Wee Herman now. I don't think when we see God, he's going to walk out looking like he's four foot. <laughs> I 
You know what happened to the thief on the cross? You know, we, we look at this and forget about, you know, people argue about the baptism, all this and that. But let me tell you something. The thief on the cross, whew, he didn't pray much. I'll guarantee he was passionate. He's dying. You remember that one thief said, you know, this guy deserves it. He's, he's as crooked as a dog's hind leg like the rest of us up here. But the other thief, he had an epiphany. He had, he had a, there was something that happened in his heart that day. He realized this guy, though, he's different. He's just. This man is being killed for something they're falsely accusing him of. I believe, I really believe he is who he says he is. He's the Messiah. And all he said to Jesus that day, and you say, well, he didn't say a whole lot, Bob, but he said it. His heart was passionate. The fervent prayers, if the fervent prayers of a righteous man, to think about that, that's that boiling heated passion. He said it avails, it produces a lot. And at that moment, that thief on the cross looks at him, and he didn't say these words. Jesus, if you're who you say you are, and if it's your will, save me. He said to Jesus, he said, when you come into your kingdom, all I'm asking is this. I know you have the power. I believe that you're who you are. When you come into your kingdom, all I'm asking is this. Remember me. Jesus says to him, just always, that's always all said. He looks at him and he says, today you will accompany me to paradise. Can you imagine Jesus walking into paradise in the lower bow? But it was not the, the punishment part. He's walking in. Can you imagine Jesus walking into Abraham's bosom? Can you imagine the, 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 whether it's the, the worship, the applause, the, 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 the shouting out? Jesus didn't just walk in there and nobody said anything. Here comes the Savior of all mankind, all of the righteous from all the way from the beginning to that present moment are there. And when Jesus walks in, can you imagine the crescendo of shout, the crescendo of, of worship? Here comes Jesus walking in and right behind him. <laughs> comes the thief. Right, right behind him, walking. There's Jesus, everybody, Jesus, uh, the Son of God. He is, he's here. It's as, as, as it's been written. He's the seed. We read we, the, the, uh, uh, the law, all of this. Here it is. The, this is the one we've been looking for. All the attention's on him. Nobody notices right behind him. Oh, I'm glad to be here. The very first one to experience on the other side of the cross was the thief. And all he prayed was, when you come into your kingdom, don't forget about me. Why? I believe it. I'll tell you something. His heart was talking a whole lot more than his words. We look at that and say, well, that wasn't much to say. But Jesus Christ recognized his heart was saying, I need saved. Spare me. This here, what I'm going through, that's not what I'm talking about. But I, what I'm saying is, I'm, I, I'm headed to hell, Jesus. And I believe that you have a kingdom of righteousness. You have a kingdom of heaven. I believe you have another kingdom that's not hell. I believe that. And I believe that what you're doing right now is sufficient for me. All I can get into words, all I can utter out is this in the middle of my present pain is, just don't forget about me. And Jesus said, you'll be right with me when I walk in. Don't worry about it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> he walked in with Jesus. It may look like, let me just close on this. It may look like you're, you're surrounded by the situation. But in reality, you're actually surrounded by God. How many times it's a temptation, we all go through it, and we all face it. And I'm closing. We feel surrounded by the situation, by people, by attacks. 
But the truth and the reality is we're actually surrounded by God himself. You, probably already in your mind, you're thinking of the story in the Old Testament with the great old prophet when they were surrounded in Dothan that night. You remember that? And, and the prophet's one of his helpers. An assistant said to him, my goodness, we're surrounded. Look at the armies all around. I mean, look. I mean, it's there. And, and, and the old prophet said, well, there's more that's with us than them. And, and, and the assistant said, he thought, he thought his mentor had lost his mind. Then he said, what are you talking about? We see them right there. They are all the way, all the way around us. We are surrounded. No, no, no. We're, we're actually surrounded by God. What do you mean? How, how look? Oh. In a little short prayer, the prophet said, Lord, open his eyes. He's not seeing it. And at an instant, God opened his eyes and standing there more than the physical military was the military of God. And you remember the rest of the story? <laughs> and the prophet said, well, it's going to be a bad day for these boys because they all gone blind and we're going to lead them all back home. <laughs> and that's what happened. They all went blind. Thousands of them went blind. They put a rope out, and they all grabbed on the rope. And when they come back home to the king, here come the prophet leading the way. The assistants had the beginning of the rope. And, and all these thousands coming up over the ridges, here they come. Prophet coming back. There they are. <laughs> How'd that happen? Well, more with us than them. We outnumbered them. No, there's only two or three of you guys. No, there's more with us than them. They underestimated that when the prophet showed up, he had actually came with thousands and thousands of a heavenly entourage of military. You're the same way. I said, you're the same way. When you walk into any situation, there's more that's with you than that with them. The only reason we don't utilize it is or draw comfort from it is our eyes are not seeing. Praise God, that can change. I'm glad to be alive, Connie. You too. That's right. Even though we're getting older. Hallelujah. 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 There's nothing to be sad about. Absolutely nothing. God has, God has us. We have him. It, what a relationship. If this man can pray that and move all of heaven, so can you. You have the blood right to do it. Hallelujah. Well, let's stand this morning. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I believe that we are in that position this morning. <clears throat>